Uh, and what you see is that the um, getting into glacial ages take a long time. Get out of the glacial ages is, is pretty rapid, 20,000 years. And the last warm period was the Holocene. So it was six to 9,000 years ago. Since the Holocene, we are supposed to enter a new glaciation. Okay? So since 6,000 years ago, our planet is supposed to cool down in order to reach the next glaciation in 70,000 years in the future. But what you see is that even though we started to slow, to, to cool down, then we suddenly rise up. Okay? One minute. What is important is that today we have been experiencing 1.2 degrees C of warming over 150 years, while the cooling, 4 to 5 degrees C, occurs what the, the, at the last glacial ages, the planet was 4 to 5 degrees C colder in 20,000 years. Okay, so it took 20,000 years to get out of this cooling and to reach our level of warming. And now we talk about reaching 2 degrees C in 250 years. So, a hundred times faster. One question and another one behind. Yes, uh, it's actually two questions. So first of all, I would like to know, or do we know, what causes the fluctuations yes, absolutely. in this? We absolutely are able to simulate that with our models. It's just the orbit of the Earth around the Sun that has astronomical variations that are very, very precise, and we are perfectly capable to do that. Okay. So and we know exactly. And okay. can they be cumulative onto what humans how humans influence the planet. So, the latest studies show that we will never enter the, the next glaciation. That's why we talk about the Anthropocene. We will never enter the, last, the next glaciation. We have gotten our, our climate out of its natural fluctuations by putting more CO2 in the atmosphere. So unless we really manage to go down to 280 ppm and to go back to reverse completely what we have done, we will never enter the, last, the next glaciation. Whether it's good news or bad news, that's not for me to say, but at least we've, we've taken our planet out of its natural trajectory. And that's mainly why we talk about Anthropocene. You had a question? Yes. Um, I do know that, um, of course, the slight variations in the orbit, on the Earth's orbit do affect the temperature, but um, what is the mechanism through which they affect carbon dioxide concentration? Any time you affect temperature, you also affect the way the, the biology functions, and thus you affect the way it pumps CO2 or it releases so CO2. Something in the sense of under glacial ages, you have smaller uh, tree cover, and that exactly. releases CO2 exactly. and it's, the expansion it's going together. Yes. Then you get the exactly. <laughs> but the signal of those variations is really the trajectory of our planet around the sun, and then everything follows. Sorry, if it was uh, trees before, how many trees do we need so that we have the balance now? What? How many trees do we need to have balance? Oh, it's not the number of trees, it's, 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 a, it's an entire system. You cannot just count trees and say if you have 2,200,000 trees, then it will work. It's not that. It's not that simple. Okay? What is normally the thing that creates the switch from getting older to getting warm? Again, it's the, it's the trajectory, it's the Earth's orbit okay. that just brings you more sun, which starts the deglaciation okay. and, and then, then it goes up. Yeah. And then it's exactly. Okay? So that, that's the, the first very important thing that I wanted to the point here is that the Anthropocene is that we have taken our planet out of its natural system. And the second thing is that from the glacial age to what we know, the planet does not look like the same at all, because here the sea level was 120 meters below what it is today. In the Mediterranean Sea, for the French people who know this area, there is a, a, a cave, the La Grotte Cosquer, that you go 
uh, uh, in scuba diving and the entry is 70 meters below sea level. At that time it was above sea level, people were living there and doing their painting. So it was, a, a, and you had three kilometers here of ice sheets all over Alaska, again Canada, England, etc. So it was a very different planet and it was just four degrees C difference. And we may have three degrees C more due to our activities by the, by the end of our century, okay? So this is uh, quite important. If now we zoom to the last uh, thousand years, so sorry here you do not see, but those, uh, so all the curves I'm showing here have a kind of hockey stick uh, uh, figure with a very sharp rise in the three greenhouse gases, the three main greenhouse gases, CO2, CH4, N2O and the concomitant rise in temperature, okay, the temperature of our planet. So, uh, climatologists generally uh, talk about anomalies in mean annual global temperature. So, you subtract the, temper the annual temperature we have today with the temperature of 1850, uh, 1900, and then you, you calculate the anomalies, and you see that we were supposed to go down, and finally, we go up. So, over the last 2,000 years, our climate has been pretty stable, and that's what, what allows the, the rise of, of the agriculture as we know it today, because it was a pretty stable climate, and the rise of population. Uh, so it was pretty stable, and suddenly it became unstable because of our activities. So what, 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 what causes this global warming? So here again you have the three uh, greenhouse gases. If you have a stable climate, the climate that we experience is, I mean, the, 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 the motion of the ocean and of the atmosphere comes from the partitioning of the energy we receive from the sun. Okay, so we, see, we receive our basic energy from the sun, from solar energy. It gets into the systems and because the, the continents are where they are today, which was not always the case, the continents are where they are today and we have the oceans, then you warm the land, you warm the ocean, and then you send back the energy to the space in the form of thermal energy, so it's infrared energy for the physicists. And if your climate was in balance, you would have as more solar energy coming in than you have infrared energy getting, going out. That's a climate in equilibrium. What we do is that we add greenhouse gas in the atmosphere and that make this infrared energy being trapped by the atmosphere, by the greenhouse gases, and instead of going back in space, it's sunk back at the surface of our Earth, so on land and on the ocean. So there is energy that is trapped within our atmosphere within our climate system instead of being radiated back to, the, to, the, to space. And that's the instability which explains why we warm our climate. And what you see here is all bubbles, is the fraction of this trapped energy in different components of our climate system. So 1% in the atmosphere is a very small percent, 5% over land, 3% over the ice, which makes the ice melt, the glaciers disappear, Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets starting to melt, and 91% of this excess energy is stored into the first 1,000 meters of the ocean. So we are storing the massive amount of excess energy into our ocean. That's very important because it means that even if you stop putting CO2, even if you would stop completely the warming of your climate, stop emitting CO2, etc., the ocean is giving back the heat to the atmosphere because it has an excess energy that is stored. So it's like a um, uh, uh, um, radiant um, a heater that 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 takes your energy with with, base with oil that you warm. And then if you unplug this, it will still radiate its energy for hours, for example. It's exactly the same. This excess energy is stored in the ocean. So that's the basic 
reasons why our climate is warming, our ocean is warming, our land is warming. Okay. Now, when we talk about climate or global warming, of course, it's not just the warming. The warming is one manifestation of the climate change. In fact, we are experiencing a climate change and not just the climate warming. And changes can be observed in all components of the climate systems. So here you have the air, the ice, the ocean, and the land. So we've talked about the, air te the temperature being uh, 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 warmer, but there is also the water vapor in the atmosphere. In fact, the more you warm your atmosphere, the more your atmosphere can hold water vapor. Okay, so for one degree C of warming of your atmosphere, you can add, you can add seven, uh, seven of additional water vapor. So the more you warm your atmosphere, the more humidity is. Then you also change atmospheric circulation because you, do, you change the, the places where uh, energy is absorbed in excess or not. I mean, you, are, you do not have the same amount of energy absorbed in all places of the world. If you are uh, on a white roof, the energy will be reflected back. If you are on a, on a vegetation, more energy will be absorbed. So you create gradient of energy and though you create uh, atmospheric circulation. We have changes in ice sheets. So you have faced the disappearance of, of a glacier in Italy, I think it was one or two years ago. There was another one in Iceland four years ago. Um, the ones who like to go in the Mont Blanc have seen the, the, the La Mer de Glace being uh, retreated also. Uh, the Arctic sea ice is having less and less ice uh, during in September, when it is the, the smallest. Uh, we are also seeing uh, um, um, sorry, uh, melting of, the, of Greenland and melting of, our, of Antarctica. Uh, in the ocean we are seeing a sea level rise. So the sea level is rising due to two reasons. One is because we bring more water to the ocean, the gla glacier melting on land do bring more additional water to the ocean, so you add water to the water, so you make the level up. Plus, an ocean that is warmer is it takes it is in expansion, so its expansion makes that it takes more space, and thus you have the sea level rising. So sea temperature is, and I've talked about the oceanic content, so more energy stored to the ocean. We have also the acidification of the ocean, which is another important uh, issue due to both CO2 in the atmosphere and excess temperature. And we also see the biology changing with migration of fishes, because they can move, uh, uh, which is not the case for corals, for example. So you see range shifts in species in the ocean, where, uh, and they go at places where we were not used to see them. On land, we also see species range shifts. The tiger mosquito in, in France was, is here because of climate change. Of course, it's here because people bring it from southern countries to France, but it has been like this for decades. But it's only recently that the, the tiger mosquito can survive in France and thus become uh, a, a nuisance for, uh, for health. Uh, we see um, predators in, uh, in trees, for example, so uh, that, that can move. The trees cannot just run fast, but, but, uh, but uh, animals or uh, insects can migrate and then they can attack uh, trees that are not used to see them, so they fragilize the trees. We have a growing season line, so with warmer temperature, uh, spring comes earlier and fall uh, and later, so you have a longer growing season for most natural vegetation. You see trees gaining northward in the boreal regions, gaining at altitudes in, in the mountains before, because um, uh, the conditions become more favorable for those. Uh, and we see changes, of course, in precipitation also in response to all uh, climate change. So 
What is important here is to see that the uh, manifestation of climate change, it's not just temperature, it's everything. Okay, it's, it's all components of the system. It's on land, it's in the ocean, it's in the atmosphere, it's in the ice sheet. And we also see uh, permafrost in the boreal regions that start melting. And that's if you see pictures of Canada, for example, in the north of Canada or of Alaska, where buildings and, and railroads have been built and have been stable for centuries, now they are just falling apart because it's melting, the permafrost is melting, and, it, and those buildings and railroads were used to be built on, on very solid ground, and now the ground is, is, is melting, so it's not solid anymore, and thus it's breaking uh, buildings, etc. So that's another manifestation of climate change. And in all those, some are really uh, unprecedented. So the accumulation in the ocean has been unprecedented for more than 18,000 years. Uh, it's the fastest sea warming that has been experienced in the last 11,000 years. The acidification has no uh, analog for the last 2 billion years. So we are really experiencing things that, that have not been observed for a very, very long time uh, on the planet. So now I want to show you that the climate change is uneven in space and in time. So in space, we talk about 1.2 degrees C of warming today, or 1.15 degrees C of warming. But the warming is not the same over the ocean, over the continents over the high latitudes and over the equator. So this figure shows you the local temperature weighted by the global temperature, so in degree C by degree C. So on each point of the globe, it shows you what is the temperature increased at this specific spot for one degree C of global warming, okay? So what you see is that all over the ocean, you are more or less below 0.5 or 0.75 degrees C of warming. So the ocean warm um, at a slower pace than the globe. The continents are the ones that warm faster. So on average over the continent, for one degree C of global warming, you have 1.5 on the continent. And in France, it's the same. Okay, so it's about 1.5. So you warm faster over land than you do on, on the globe. And what you see also is that you have a gradient between the equator and the pole with polar regions that warm much faster. In certain areas in Alaska, they, have, they are already at 4 degrees C of warming. While on the globe, we are at 1.15. Okay, so it's much faster because we have some feedbacks due to the snow, the ice sheets, uh, the, the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, the ice on, 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 uh, on, on the ocean. Sorry, but my latest classes were essentially in French, so I'm just uh, using my English. Okay, so this is really important to, sh to, 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 to feel that really we have this uneven distribution of temperature. But what you see here, and that will be different for precipitation, is that Everywhere on Earth, it's warming. Uh, at the annual levels, it's warming everywhere. There is no place that is experiencing a cooling today. Okay, so it's warming everywhere. Yes. Do the dots on the map mean anything? The dots on the map mean uh, things where, or um, and I will show you some others. It's the agreement between the various climate models. But I will come back to to this on, on another map. Okay. Can I ask one question? Yes, sure. So, like, how come, for example, Russia is uh, in a really, really bad situation? As far as I know, it has Siberia and it has a lot of, I don't know. Uh, you mean I mean, the, 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 the pole uh, part. Right? Yeah. Because it's land. Most of the land are at the same at the same color. And the more continental you are, the mm -hmm. more you are experiencing warming. So you see that it's, it's essentially the, the oceanic facet that is warming uh, at, a, at a lower pace. But everywhere you are on continent, 
uh, remember in the um, in the ocean you accumulate the energy and the heat distributed within the 1,000 meters uh, the first 1,000 meters depth of the ocean you do not have, have any depth on the continents so it's really warming very fast the the, the, the crust of the ocean of the of the continent but and you have you have other feedbacks that are purely physics but uh, so, so, so Russia is not experiencing things that are that are bigger than anywhere else. I mean, it's really the continents. Okay. Just a question. I thought that uh, I read in a recent paper that uh, west of Europe was warming up yeah. much, much faster than the uh, eastern part of Europe. Uh, and it doesn't show on this map. No, it doesn't show on this map. That doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that the latest uh, results are wrong or better. That's uh, that's uh, the, the the new. That's based on the, on a, on a, an immense quantity of climate models. Yeah. And the latest result that you saw are have just made a selection of the models, trying to constrain them with the extreme weather events we have experienced recently. So it could be that this map changes a little bit in the future. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's science in progress. Today. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> trying to understand what the metric exactly is. It, is it uh, change by mean change? So it's a change yes, it is the degree cel Celsius of local change for one degree Celsius of global change. So it's delta local by delta okay. local. So it means that uh, at a specific spot you can be uh, 0.5 degrees C when the globe is at 1 degree C of warming or 2 degrees C if the globe is at 1 degree C of warming. So it's the global change compared to the global one. Change compared to the benchmark. So it's the delta local divided by the delta global. Okay, but the delta compared to when? What? When, is, when is the delta measured from? What is the reference point? Time. Reference well, it's the, it's the warming from 1850. From 18 Everything is measured uh, starting in 1850, which is the start of the Industrial Revolution. Curiosity. Um, I mean, of course, I have no access to the data, so I'm just getting the You can have access to the data. It's free of access for any of No, but I meant that <laughs> I haven't seen it. Uh, but maybe you have, which is by um, just a curiosity. Uh, have there also been areas, for example, which have gone cooler no. on average? No. We can have a specific year that is cooler, but not the climate. And the climate is based on 30 years average. The climate is not one specific year. The climate is mean of 30 years. So there is absolutely no possibility that uh, we are experiencing like a negative fraction. Where it has not been observed. It has not been observed yet. Okay? It could be ideal. Okay, so, um, yeah, so this I have not updated this number. Uh, it's 1.15 uh, now. Um, what is interesting is that here it shows you the, the some billions of people <laughs> that live in different, because it's uneven in space. You can see where people live, what is the temperature they have already experienced mm. since 1850. And you see that there are marginal people, but uh, there are some 100,000 people that already live in a climate that is almost 3 degrees C warmer. That's true, for example, of very, very high latitudes in Alaska. Already 3 degrees C warmer than uh, what they had experienced in 1850. And you have a, a, a large majority of people who are already living in temperatures warmer than 1.5 degrees here of warming, which is more or less what we have experienced here in France. And you have, uh, 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 so, so you see that there is the distribution in, a, we have about 20 to 40 percent of the world population that lived in a region that was 1.5 degrees C warmer during the decade 2006-2015 already. Okay, so that, that's important because when we talk about a 1 degree C global warming or a 1.5 degree C global warming, it doesn't mean anything for any of us. 
Okay? Even for a climatologist, it's, it's just a number. So what's very important is how this is incarnated where you live. How, what does it mean in the place, in your garden, in, in the way where you spend your vacations, etc., etc. So it's also a, a nice way to, to have a look at it. So we have looked at temperature, but now let's look at uh, rainfall. So here it's the same map as the one we've seen earlier, but based on the precipitation. So it's a, it's a delta local of rainfall in percent compared to uh, pre-industrial rainfall divided by temperature. So it's percent change of rainfall per degree C of, of global warming. What you see, not see really nicely here, <laughs> is that you have a change in precipitation on the y-axis per degree C of warming. And if you look at the global scale, the more you warm the, the planet, the more rainfall increases at the planet level. And that's because, what I said earlier, your atmosphere, when it gets warmer, can hold more water vapor. So if you can put more water vapor in the atmosphere, when it's raining, you have more water to condense, and in fact, it's raining more, okay? So at the global scale, the more you warm the planet, the more you will have rainfall globally. But what you see here is that you have negative numbers and positive numbers, contrary to what we saw earlier for temperature. So there are areas that are getting wetter and there are areas that are getting drier at the annual scale. And this time the dots, it's the, it's the certainty, again, it's the agreement between all the climate models. What you see if you look at at, at Western Europe, for example, is that we know that the Mediterranean area is getting drier and drier, and the more we will warm our climate, the drier the Mediterranean regions will get. We know that the very high latitudes are getting wetter, and we know that in between, there is a, a transition going from regions that are getting drier to regions that are getting wetter. We don't know exactly where the limit is, that makes projections in the future more difficult. What you see also is that Australia is getting drier and drier. We are getting drier conditions also in the Amazon. So Amazon is going to get drier if we continue to deforest it, but it's also going to get drier if the climate continues to warm. It's the same for Central America, Southern Africa, and, uh, and you've got main, main parts of the ocean that are going to receive less less water and the monsoon regions are going to get more water and the very high latitudes and equatorial regions over the ocean. So you see that there is a very large uneven distribution of those changes in total rainfall, total annual rainfall in very different regions. And we are really certain wherever we have those dots, we are really certain that the trend is shared by all climate models on the globe for the moment. And you have more than 50 global climate models that exist in the world today. Yes. Okay, I, I don't want to paint this in a positive light, but what I find <coughs> interesting is that in the Sahara or Central Asia or Arabia, where you would usually find deserts, there is suddenly a high Okay, so the Sahara, there. you divide a very small change by something which is close to zero. So in fact, it should be uh, more pale. It's just because the, 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 the here, the delta is almost zero. Okay, so that's why it's, it shows. So yes, there is a, a slight wetting. So we uh, won't of those see it regions. suddenly turning into lush greenland. So well, at least we haven't found one climate model that greens the Sahara okay. in the future. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but we haven't found one. Yes. Will we ha have like rising ocean level, like water level? We are already at uh, 50 centimeter, uh, and yes, uh, I will show you later. Uh, will, some we, will we have pictures which area on Earth will be underwater? Oh yes, of course, yeah. the Barbados. I don't know if you've, uh, you you can look at the Prime Minister of the Barbados Island. Uh, she made a, a wonderful speech. I think it was in the COP at Copenhagen. 
and um, saying that in 50 years from now, her country will not exist anymore. It will be completely underwater. So yes, the small islands, uh, areas that are already at sea level on the coastal area or slightly below sea level are going to, are going to disappear. So yes, there are massive areas. That's one of the reasons why uh, laws in many countries are going to change to uh, forbid people to um, build houses and buildings close by the sea. Because then you are not going to ask uh, insurance to cover the risks of disappearance of those houses because you know they will disappear. Okay, so it's really something that, that, that is quite uh, important. But yeah, you have, you have many, that's, that's why you have all the islands that are really worried, is that mo many of them are going to disappear. All the ones that are almost at sea level are going to disappear. And not in 200 years, within the following decades. So that's, that's a real issue. Um, now, if we, so I've shown uh, the uneven distribution of climate change in space. Now we are going to have a look at the, the changes in time. And that horrible figure shows you the season of the greatest warming that has been observed since 1850. So orange is December, January, February. <coughs> Blue is March, April, May. Uh, green is June, July, August. And, and purple is September, October, November. And if we just focus on France, for example, you see that in, in the Mediterranean area, the summer, is the season of the greatest warming since 1850. In the Massif Central and the middle of France, it has been essentially winter. On coastal areas, it's essentially uh, fall. And in the, the northern part of, of France, it was a uh, spring. So this is important for the living, of course. It's important for the ski season, I mean, in ski resorts. Uh, most of ski resorts in France that are below or at maximum at 1500 meter altitude, they know that if they want to renew their uh, mechanical um, uh, lift, uh, they, they are going to lose money because there will be no more, they need 25 years in order to absorb their investment and, uh, and, and uh, they will not be able to ski for 25 more years if you do not have altitudes higher than 1,500 meters. Okay, so, so, so when the season of greatest warming occurs is something that is important also. And then the last, in terms of the uneven, is of course all the extreme weather events, which is what probably make more people believe in climate warming. It's not the gradual change in climate, it's more the extremes that we experience. And we know, for example, that the increase in frequency, intensity, and duration of heat waves over all land areas are occurring, and they can very robustly be attributed to uh, climate warming. We know that the increase in magnitude of intense precipitation events occurs everywhere, and again can be attributed to climate warming. This is again due to the same thing. An atmosphere is warmer, you have more water vapor in the atmosphere. When this water vapor condenses, it's more water that comes on land. So the intensity of rainfall is always going to be bigger than it was in the past. So the risks of inundation, pluvial inundation, will increase everywhere, especially if the ground is, uh, is concrete and is not able to absorb this, uh, this rainfall. And regarding droughts, we know that the frequency intensity of droughts have increased, but in some regions, like the Mediterranean, Occidental Asia, many parts of South America, and large regions in Africa and Northeast Asia, those, in those regions we can attribute the extent of droughts to a climate warming. In many other regions, like in the far east of France, for example, that has experienced recent droughts over the last decade, the attribution to, to human activities, that's the attribution to climate warming, is not yet obvious. So yes, we can say that they were abnormal, but we cannot say yet whether we can attribute them to climate warming or whether they are just an extreme that will come one and will never occur for 100 years, for example. Okay, so the attribution 
of a specific event to climate change is a statistic study. And if you have never observed any event of that sort, and if you are not able with your model to say whether it is linked to uh, global warming, then it's very hard to say it's the fault of human. Okay? So any, that's why climate uh, modelers or climatologists are sometimes reluctant to say this is due to climate warming because we need to be able to prove it at least numerically by some calculations. And when we do not manage to do that, then we prefer to say, yes, it's possible, but we do not have any certainty, any, uh, we are not 100% sure. And in France, for example, a very, uh, a very important heat wave occurred in 2019, where there were some uh, new ones uh, in 2022 and also in 2023, this year. But it was the first time in France that a national exam uh, was stopped and reported at later times because it was too hot for the, stu for the, for the kids to, to really uh, think properly in their classrooms and are not built to, uh, to, uh, to support uh, this uh, temperature rise. And what was interesting is that this heat wave, like 2022, would never have happened in 1850. So without global warming, those events would never have happened. 2003 happened, but it had one chance over 600 to occur uh, at that time. Today it has one chance over 50 to occur again. So this one, with our level of warming, has one out of 50 chances to occur. If we reach 1.5 degrees of warming, which will probably be around 2030, it will have one chance out of 10 to occur. And if we reach 2 degrees C of warming, which can be around 2050 or 2060, this, this one out of four years, we will experience such a heat wave. For 2022, it's the same. Okay? So it's really, there is this acceleration of those extreme weather events that become normal that will become normal in the future because when it occurs one out of four years, it's not an extreme anymore. It becomes a normal, uh, a, a normal climate. And what we do say, and it's a time where th these are vineyards, where they just burn, I mean the grapes just burn in a few hours because they reached temperatures that their physiology could not support. And that's quite important because when we discuss with people, on, uh, with farmers, for example, or with ecologists, the idea is to, to tell them just build your experience on those recent events that will become normal summer in France and think about what you could have done better to face those temperatures. That's the only way today to really get ready for adaptation. So what could you have done to make your life better or the life of your crop better at that time with those temperatures? If you had known before, what solutions could you have chosen? What plants could you have planted rather than, uh, than uh, well, vineyards are, are there for decades, but with, instead of wheat or maize or whatever, would you have planted sorghum, for example, or is it, would, have been, would it have been better? Would you have reached a better yield or not? So that's the way we can think, it's really thinking on um, very recent past events that have been experienced and that we know will occur more often. A way to look at, um, a way to look at, the, at the extreme is, uh, is this uh, temperature is more or less following the Gaussian curve. So it's easy to think this way for temperature. And this is the normal climate where you have, let's say, 5% of hot extremes and 5% of very cold extremes. With the climate change, you are shifting this curve on your right. That's very idealized, but it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit like this. And when you shift this curve on your right, it means that those very cold weather events, you do not experience them anymore. 
But the very hot e extreme events that you experience only 5% of your time, of course, are now occurring more and more often, and they are not extremely warm. Okay? That's just a mathematical way to see uh, what I've just seen earlier. And this figure, Switzerland has built it with its real observed temperatures from 1864 to 1990 with all the blue bars. So one bar is one year. And they have looked at temperature during summertime only. And the red is from 1991 to 2018. And you see that indeed the most recent years are completely shifted on your right hand side with in 2018, so now I could have added 2022, etc., with 18, uh, uh, 2018 at that time being the warmest, warmest ever experienced in Switzerland. So we do see, we can draw the theoretical curves by using our own records on temperature. Um, so, in summaries, people talk about climate urgency, but in fact they are right, because there are many impacts that are already irreversible, like the melting of glaciers. Of course, at the scale of planet Earth, uh, it's probably not totally ir irreversible, but at the, at the, the time life of our societies, they are ir irreversible. The melting of permafrost, which is in progress, sea level rise, which really leads to the loss of land. And we have a rapid increase of exposed populations. And I will show you later that many regions can quickly become uninhabitable and the extremes, we've just talked about the extremes. Okay, so how do we know that climate change is caused by human activities? In fact, we, uh, sorry for this cut, but we looked at all factors that do influence climate. And we think we are not forgetting one uh, uh, that, uh, that influences climate. So the, there is the Earth orbit, that's the 100,000 year cycles that we talked about at the very beginning. So it's how the planet uh, uh, goes around the Sun. So of course in our late last 150 years it has no effect because it's 100,000 years that needs to be uh, taken into account. The natural variability, that's the El Nino that you probably read about recently. Those are anomalous temperatures in Eastern Pacific. And this is a natural phenomenon that comes every four to seven years. And that results from the interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean. So we know how to produce El Nino in our climate models. Not exactly at the right timing because it's a natural phenomenon that is a non-linear dynamics. So you cannot pace it. You cannot say in 18, in 1997 I will be able to produce mine in my own model. It's impossible. But we know how to reproduce them in our climate model at the right pace. So that's natural variability and it can bring temperatures that are quite bigger for a specific year that climate change itself. But it, then it goes up, it goes off, and temperature go back to normal. There is the volcanic activity. Anytime you, there is a huge volcano activity, it blocks part of the solar radiation, and it cools the climate, but only by 0.1 degrees C at the global scale, not more. There is the solar activity, which was a uh, what, uh, what the climate skeptics used a lot, to say, ah, oh, there are 11 year cycle uh, 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 solar eruptions and that brings uh, warmer conditions of the planet. Yes, but not bigger than 0 0.1 degrees C of warming every 11 or 12 years. Very for a specific year and that's it. And there are all the anthropogenic factors, which is our greenhouse gases, the way we use our land, etc. What we do in our climate models is that we take into account all those factors. And because it's a model, because it's a tool, you can deactivate certain components. So you can tell your model, I want you to see only the natural causes. And that's the green bar. The observation is the black one. And again, it's difference in annual temperatures compared to 1850 
1900. So it's anomalies in global mean annual temperature. So if you apply only natural causes, El Nino, uh, volcanoes, uh, so solar eruption, you see that the climate would not have changed at all. Nothing would have happened. Then if you add just the greenhouse gases, so methane, CO2, and 2 then you would have had the pink curve, which would have been warmer with a climate that would have been warmer than what we had experienced. And then you add all our other activities, so all other pollutants, apart from greenhouse gases that we are putting into our atmosphere. And then this only would have cooled the climate. And if you add everything, natural causes, greenhouse gases, and other pollutants, then you have the gray curve that embrace the observations. So when we say, yeah. when we say we are sure that our climate change over the past 150 years are due to human activities, it's because we are unable to reproduce the observations without accounting for the human activities using our climate models. Yeah. Um, the aerosols, like uh, the ice or something like the salt, salt aerosols or something of the sort, but then where do they come from? What type of human activity produces them? Aerosols. Um, when you, you have a, 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 an aerosol bomb uh, with uh, things for. for like you know, exactly. All these pollutants, plus when you. When you build um, uh, uh, wheels for your car, it puts some aerosols in the atmosphere. So all our activities that we pollute our atmosphere all the time. In cities, uh, you have a lot of pollution, not always due to only cars, and, uh, and those are blocking the solar radiation. And that's in France in the 1990s. Uh, there was a, a, um, a feeling that we had accelerated the warming in France, which is not correct, because it followed lows on, uh, on pollution. And the more you remove pollution from your atmosphere, the more you will see the global warming. So pol other pollutants just bl block part of the warming that we are experiencing today. So of course, all the removing of the pollutants that we are targeting will accelerate a little bit the global warming of our planet. But we need to do this for healthcare, mm -hmm. of course. Okay? Yes? Can you say a little bit about exactly how the modeling is done? Is it from first principles physics? Or yes, of course. Uh, climate model is a huge... Um, it's all the... the it's, all the co it's not just physics, it's all the, it's the dynamics of the fluids ocean and, and the atmosphere that you put in equation is how clouds form, how uh, aerosol interact with water vapor and then uh, provoke condensation and then rainfall, it's how land and atmosphere interact, how vegetation transpire, how it absorbs CO2, so it's all our knowledge of those very interactions that you put in equation in a, in a global climate model. From something from Mechanistic, it's a mechanistic model from first exactly. Or exactly. is it more machine learning? No, 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 no. Well, it's not yet machine learning, it's coming. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, well, I think it's, we have to be slow. Uh, but, uh, but no, no, it's essentially mechanistic. And there are things that are empirical, like cloud formation in a global climate model, it's a little bit empirical. Uh, and that's where, for example, machine learning is expected to give a, to do a better job. But no, no, it's a mechanistic model, and, and it's uh, so you, you you model the ocean, the ice sheet formation, the atmosphere, the land, and the interaction between all those components. So, what's the difference between any two models? Is it between what? Any, say, any well, two because models. because you don't you don't know all the parameters with uh, absolutely precisely. I mean, the, you do not. Um, it's what we call parameterizations. Not all things are like the Navier-Stokes law that really uh, uh, describes exactly how fluid moves. Uh, if you describe how the plant transpires, it's not 
something that you know with a pure physical theory and, with, and, and at the scale at which you are using it, you have uh, numbers that you have to adjust. So it's not it's not that that uh, absolute, it's not that perfect. It's not that the experiment because it's not exactly technologies. It's not what? It's not different methodology. They are all mechanistic models, but yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can we have an access to this data? What? Is it possible to have an access to this data? Well, all the data are available on a, on a, on a core, and you have access to all the results from all climate models. Uh, it's huge NetCDF files, uh, and anyone can have access to that, yes, of course. And uh, we are happy the more people we have working with those data sets, of course, also. Okay, so um, projected futures. So how are they built? So one thing to understand is that when, when you have access to future projections of climate, the climate people come last. The first one who work on the scenarios are demographers, economists, that help to build the future society. And when we know what the future society will look like, we can assume what it will emit, what type of pollutants we will find in the atmosphere, how many greenhouse gases will be, uh, and then we can use our climate models because our climate models take everything like this as input. So we start with imagining tomorrow's society. How many people? What will be the te technological choices? What will be the environmental politics? What will be the behavior of changes? Will all people uh, eat uh, meat? Or will all people be vegan? Or uh, what will be the origin of the clothes? Uh, petrol or cotton or lime or whatever? So this is what, so, so, so all the specialists of this work together and they derive the consequent evolutions of greenhouse gases, uh, soil exploitation, so where are the crop areas, where are the new forest areas, where do we grow um, um, like, uh, biofuels, uh, etc. where do we grow fruit trees, etc. So all the things that we need to give to our climate models in order for it to calculate future climate. Okay? Because a climate is just a climate model is just the assemblages of ocean, land, uh, ice and atmosphere, but the natural system. We do not account for humans in it. Humans are not a model to the climate system. So we need to give to our climate model the human influence. So it's emissions, and that's only when we can go and model the future climates. So that's very important because climatologists come at the very end of the process and not at the very beginning of the process. So when you do this, you end up, this is from 18, uh, 1980 to 2100, and these are the emissions of fossil fuels and cement in a in gigaton of CO2 per year. And each line is a scenario proposed by all these group of scientists before climate people. Okay? So you end up with thousands of possible future, of possible trajectories in terms of emissions of pollutants, greenhouse gases, uh, soil exploitation, etc. And then you choose some of them because we cannot run a climate model for more than 1,000 trajectories. It's impossible. It's taking too much time, computing too much uh, computer resources, and uh, using too much space. Uh, in uh, one simulation, it's terabytes of, of, of uh, climate data that are stored and produced. So it's impossible to have everything in a, in a data center. So what we do is that we take some of those specific scenarios here for example four of them have been taken one of a very very high end scenario one very close to paris agreement and others that are quite different and you see here the level of warming associated with each of those specific trajectories so if we manage to follow paris agreement we will probably limit 
uh, climate to 1.5 or 2 degrees C. But if we do some business as usual, we may end up with 5 degrees C warming, etc. Yes. I was just wondering because I saw there's like a whole area of not net negative global emissions. Yes. Um, like, don't these scenarios only work? Like, I, I only I've only read very superficially on this, but aren't there like objects in the climate model, such as uh, carbon capture and storage or bioenergetic carbon capture and storage, which are necessary to even reach that point, but which are like, which only exist in the imagination of the modelers and cannot be applied at scale yet. Yes, that's a very good point that I, I tend to raise a lot, a lot, is that yes, I mean, modelers end up with negative emissions, which you see here. Yeah. And yes, of course, we know that we will never be able to reach absolute net zero in terms of emissions. So we will need to compensate by CO2 uh, capture in one, one way or, or another. And this is how do we do this. So it's not just the imagination. So there are uh, processes by which you can um, capture CO2 uh, in big factories where they are emitted. They do this in uh, uh, petroleum platforms, for example. They capture the CO2 when it's emitted. And they just liquefy it and put it back in the in the fossil um, uh, uh, the fossil uh, sink where they extract uh, the, the petrol. Uh, other solutions exist. I think it's in Finland that they have a, a spot where they do uh, capture CO two from the atmosphere, extract it from the air, then liquefy it, etc. But it's a very energy more process. So yes, we are far from finding the solutions. You are, so you are right, we will never be able to reach the net zero without being able to capture CO2 in a way or another and put it back on land. That's why people are putting, thinking about planting forests, but that will not be the sufficient. You are right, it's a, it's a, big, it's a, big, it's a big issue and a big question. But, I mean, in the scenarios that are calculated now, isn't it like necessary, for example, to say if it's still possible to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius? Aren't you already, are, aren't the models already relying on the deployment of these technologies at scale? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> but, 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 yes, of course, of course, they do rely on that. So that's the theory. They do rely on that. So um, what we what we do? That was funny because in the last IPCC uh, exercise, the sixth exercise. Um, when the governments asked climatologists to publish a report on a global warming of 1.5 degrees C, what, what, what does it mean and is it possible? None of us wanted to go and do the exercise because we did not believe it would be possible. And then finally we did it. And the good point about it is that we really worked hard on the impacts at 1.5 degrees and managed to show that if you go from 1.5 to 2 or from 2 to 2.5, the degradation of the environment, the impact on the planet will, will be way bigger. And they are not linear. They can be completely non-linear. So, so that was the good point of really playing the game. But you are right, none of the trajectory to reach 1.5 degrees C, given the technologies, etc., even the one below, do um, uh, work without absorbing CO2 with technologies that we do not know very very well today. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a thought exercise. Um, let's see the person in the yeah. Right, it's a real issue. Yeah. Isn't that true for all the curves that go down? All the curves that cross the zero. So all, almost all new curves. Mm -hmm. How about the other ones that are just above? The, 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 oh, the ones that are just above are the ones that do not need negative energy to, uh, to, uh, to that you see that they may reach 3 degrees. If you take today all the uh, engagement from all the countries that have been uh, proposed at the last COP, if you put together all the engagements which are not respected by most countries, even though they go in the right direction, they do not go at the magnitude of what they proposed, 
we will reach three degrees here for me. With all wills expressed by all countries. So to go one point to, to reach one point five degrees here or to not cross over one point five degrees here is almost impossible to do. So, so maybe we will do it like here. Another shoot and then come back in some decades we will find means to do that. But we will probably uh, go over to that's that's for sure. Just a comment. Yeah. So we are not living good future for the next generation. No. No, and I no, I think the I don't know if, if you look at the last IPCC report, the synthesis report, they I, I, I did not uh, use this uh, this curve here. They have plotted um, uh, the the stripes of different trajectories of uh, of climate warming and with uh, the dates of birth of people. So the ones uh, that who who were. Um, who were uh, born in 1930 and then in 1970 and then in 2000, 2020, etc. And then you show how many the gradient of temperature that each generation is crossing. And the ones who are built, who are who, who were born in 2000, are the ones who are going to experience the, the strongest gradient of warming change. So with no, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> with no stable climate. I mean. Uh, my grandparents had a very stable climate, and I had more or less, uh, not really stable, but probably more stable than the one you are going to experience. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, okay, so that's the transition in temperature. So what I think what that is important is that here you look at two, um, a, a very uh, reasonable increase in climate change, so Paris Agreement and, and the client business as usual. And what you see is that over the next 20 to 30 years, even though we act positively, we will not immediately see the results of our actions. And that's something which is very difficult also to tell to uh, people in factories or to everyone, is that our future climate over the, last, the next 20 to 30 years is already written in a way. Whatever we start doing now is really going to show up after 2040 or 2050. This is because whatever we do is just small additional or small decrease of CO2 we put in the atmosphere, which will not be big enough in 20 years to uh, show in terms of temperature. We will see it in terms of level of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, chemical composition of the atmosphere, but not in terms of temperature signal. Yeah. You, you had a question? No, you had a question. Sorry. Yeah, like just a uh, Yeah, like that is also like the complexity of like telling this to policymakers because they would like there is a, an election like coming up and they have like it's either like okay like that is not my problem because the, the solution or what I do now it will be reflected. In 30 years, yeah. so I would rather like uh, put more resources on labor market or yeah, like creating jobs or whatever. It's very, very complex. Yeah, it's that's very complex. Exactly. No, no, no. It's very complex to really. So that's why I said the the, <coughs> the experiencing the climate extremes, being able to explain that it is an extreme today, but it will not be an extreme mm -hmm. tomorrow, okay. is probably the best we can use to convince policymakers about the future and about taking actions. But when you talk about total energy, uh, the, the, the IPCC report has written that if you exploit all already existing uh, um, uh, oil um, uh, sinks, for example, the ones that we, we extract petroleum now, today, if we go to, to, the, their, uh, to the end of their expectation, we are already exceeding 2 degrees C of warming. So any new additional one will lock our future. And that's what they are doing. Creating new, uh, uh, new uh, shores, new offshore uh, um, drilling, uh, which, which will lock inevitably our future because they will want to make money out of it. So this should be stopped completely. 
it should be completely so so again we have a problem to, to talk to, to, to those people. That's that's very hard. Uh, if we go to the climate model, so um, I just wanted to show you um, one way also to evaluate our climate model. So in the 2200, we had some, uh, that was between the third and the fourth IPCC report. So um, the, at the fourth IPCC report, all this part was future projection and all this part was historical things that have been experienced. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this, you look at the colors here, it's what has been observed since then. And the black line was what our climate models were projecting for those 20 years. And when you look at this, you see that what was projected at that time, so what was the future at that time for our climate model, really happened as we have predicted. So there is a consistency in the use of our climate model which has not been proved to be wrong so far in the projections they made. So any time there is a new IPCC <coughs> report, we go back. In the previous IPCC report, we looked at what was the projections and we looked at what has happened. And we see whether our models were right or wrong. And so far, they were always right. Okay, so that's one way also for us to give more trust in uh, our model projection because again it's a model so it's not it's not another planet earth on which we can with which we can play it's really a, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a computer i mean it's playing with a computer uh, this this curve we, we talked about the co2 and, and and adding co2 into the atmosphere we know today that our warming, which is on the y-axis, is proportional to the accumulated emissions of CO2 since 1850. Okay, so this curve shows here the amount of CO2 accumulated that we emit since 1850, and here is the uh, temperature of our planet. So all the black lines is what has already happened. So we have already emitted 2,300 gigaton uh, of CO2, which has led to 1.1, 1.2 degrees of warming. And knowing this slope, we can infer when we will reach 1.5 degrees of warming. So 1.5 degrees of warming with an uncertainty can be reached if we add something like 600 gigaton of CO2 more into the atmosphere. And in 2019, we had emitted 40 gigaton of CO2. So per year, we emit between 40 and 45 gigaton of CO2. And if we have only 700 left to cross the 1.5 degree C level of uh, warming, then you can just do your own calculations and calculate when we will cross this level of warming in our planet, okay? And same thing for two degrees, etc. You can uh, you can do, do it for yourself. Yeah. So, good question. Um, in the last slide, and this as well, we have reference to these um, SSP ones, SSP twos, and SSP threes. Um, what are the differences? Okay, I assume they're uh, models. Okay. Or, uh, so the, the 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 naming of those the naming of those scenarios. So SSP is for shared socio-economic pathways. Okay. So let's say it's SSPX and then you have a white dot Z8. This is 1.5, 8.5, it can be 7.0. This, this number are watts per meter square, so it's an additional quantity of energy resulting from the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Okay? So, um, so that's the number of, of uh, no sorry the first one is 2.6 because 
because we are already at 0.3 watt per square meter. So that's, that's uh, the, the, the level of additional energy you put to your, into your atmosphere due to the CO2. So the bigger is this number, the warmer will be your planet. The SSPX, this is to, uh, it goes from one to five. So this is a, a combination of, um, uh, I, don't, I don't have, no, I don't have a, a, a spotty. It's a combination of uh, behavior, technological choices, uh, demographic information, um, regional or cooperation or rivalry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's really uh, the societal world. So there are five different typical societal worlds that can lead to one of those numbers. Okay, so that's the new way to name it. And you see, 1.9, 2.6, 4.0. Those you should essentially refer to four climates refer to those last digits which give you the level of energy you put in your atmosphere. So the bigger is the digit, the warmer will be your climate. And with the X, the bigger the digit, the more... With the X, the first number? Well, in fact, you, you can... Um, well, they have chosen, let's say, the number 5, but you could reach 8.5 watt per square meter additional energy with uh, SSP3, for example. So it's really different ways that the society will borrow to reach this level of warming in the atmosphere. But they are not ordered necessarily, as in They are not ordered, no. Um, no, I don't think so. I can't remember. Generally, they are, uh, they are divided uh, by um, levels, uh, levels uh, of uh, cooperation, and I think they are levels uh, of uh, sustainability, something like that, and then you feel uh, you feel the matrix, and you have a, a middle of the road, and you have uh, four four uh, digits like this. Okay. So that's the way more or less they are used. That's really the social demographics, and I, uh, I I have not uh, I have not taken a slide showing that. Okay. Yeah. Imagine uh, we would commit completely to staying under 1.5 degrees with the technologies we currently have. Could you describe a bit what the world would look like? What, what scenario that would entail? I'm not sure I understood your question. Um, with the world we are having now, we will never stay under 1.5 degrees. It's impossible. <laughs> what, what is the best we could do? What would the best action look like based on the current technologies we have now? Ah, you have, I mean, you have, um, it, it's, uh, it's being more sober, it's uh, so, so it, it's, uh, there is no choice. If you read the last assessment report of IPCC, because I'm a physicist, I'm a climatologist, I'm not someone in technology, I'm not someone in social demography, I'm not an economist, <laughs> but you have, uh, you have, we know that you do not, you do not need new, new, new technologies to manage. You just need to implement things properly. So for agriculture, we know exactly what to do. Uh, we are locked by um, the, the world market uh, and by uh, big companies. But we do not, that's, that's the thing that I just, the last IPCC report has shown, is that we, um, we, we are not in a state where we do not know what to do. We know what to do to really uh, lower our emissions. Maybe not to reach absolute zero. Well, if you think, for example, today in France, uh, one person emits uh, uh, 11 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. That's a French person, a Senegalese. In Senegal, it's 0.2 ton of CO2 equivalent per year. And we think we can manage if all the world uh, emits only two tons of CO2 per year. And there are ways to go from 11 to 2 without suffering. That has been demonstrated in the, in, in, in the last reports and in many papers. And Nathalie probably will be able to answer this question much better than I do. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Actually, I'm trying to understand if it will ever happen. I don't think so because we have so many differences. And we are talking about global level. Yes, we have so many differences: the background, the culture, the mentality, yeah, preferences, right. humans. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, how would it be possible to 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 act politically, which is kind of impossible? And the next question is. It's not a question. It's a straight comment. Yeah, <laughs> because and which of these phases, I don't know, models are we facing in the future if we face the reality, not just if we reach, because I don't think we're gonna do that with our differences. It's not gonna ever happen. So, so first, let me tell you one thing. First, uh, the first IPCC report was in 1991. At that time, even in the climatologist community, we were not as um, sharp in talking about climate change as we are now. Even in our community. Okay? So, since 1980, 1990, so in 50 years, things have changed uh, in 40 years, things, no, in 30 years, things have changed considerably. So many countries have managed to limit their emissions. 80 countries of the world have managed to reduce their emissions of CO2. The population knowledge is growing. Uh, many of your generation is already taking good habits. So this for me is a real positive trend. So what we need to do is continue to, uh, to, um, to give this knowledge to everyone, people in the public policy, uh, people at the governments, people in industries. Uh, you've got you've got the, the uh, CEC in France, la Convention des entreprises pour le climat. So it's uh, um, big and um, uh, uh, companies of different sizes that have come together two years ago, and now they are renewing this at the regional level. And they have taken class, so each each uh, director of this those companies has to follow six weeks of classes on ecology, climate, resources, learn about things, and then propose things to change. So that's good sign, also. Okay, there's not a, not total energy. Maybe we will have to write them in, in it at one point. Uh, but but so, so things are moving, and they are moving in the right direction. So, and, and what is, when I talk here about Africa and about France, it's because it leaves room for, to, to multiply by 10 their capacity to emit and thus to reach certain level. And for us, dividing by 10 does not mean we are going to live a, be a, a, a bad life. So there is hope for me, but it will take time. Of course, we think we do not have time, that's true. I mean, we have less and less time, the more time goes on, but, but we have more and more people informed, and we need to continue to form people, the much we can, as much as we can. Thank okay. Uh, so this is just it's a little bit the same and we come back to a question about the dots now they are just uh, hatching mm -hmm. but uh, it shows you um, so uh, 1.5 degree C warmer world 2 degree C warmer world changes in temperature changes in rainfall what you see is that the changes so anytime you have a, a hatch it means that all climate models agree on the direction and the magnitude and you see that for temperature, there is no disagreement between the climate models. There are disagreements along the climate models regarding rainfall, and that's a difficult uh, issue. But you see that there is no disagreement in areas that are really going to get drier, and in areas that are going to get strongly wetter. But there are, for example, most of France, except the Mediterranean Sea, we have disagreements between the model because we do not know when 
we will go from the area where the water, the rainfall will decrease from the area where the total rainfall will increase. So the limit, the latitudinal limit between this uh, change between drying and wetting, we do not know it exactly. But there are many places where we do know what will happen. And we can start working uh, on those areas already in terms of adaptation. And what you see also is what, when you increase the temperature, the patterns of changing rainfall or temperature do not change, they just intensify. So we, one thing that we, we are not sure about is whether any time we increase the climate warming by 0.5 degrees C, for example, will we change completely the distribution of weather on the planet? And in fact, no, it's just harder and harder that it has the same pattern almost everywhere. If we look at, we will just maybe concentrate on, on the left panel, uh, or, or yeah, or maybe on, on the right because you know that's that's okay. We see this. So this is showing you uh, uh, an event that used to occur once every ten years without the human influence. What happens to this specific event when? Uh, so this is a, a heat wave when climate is warming. So what we have today is 1.2 degrees C hotter. Hotter. We know that already it can occur three times, three out of ten years. And it's going to be 1.2 degrees C hotter. That's for a 1 degree C of warming. If we reach 1.5 degree C of warming, this same event will occur four times out of ten and will be almost 2 degrees C warming. So if your heat wave was 30 degrees, then it will be 32. And if we reach 2 degrees C of warming, then we will reach 6 out of 10 years, this same event, which will be 2.6 degrees C hotter, etc. So you see that there is no linearity in the increase of, of, uh, of uh, extreme events. So the extreme events uh, occur and increase faster than the mean global climate. Another way to see it is um, if you look at France, and here you have uh, the, the heat waves that have occurred in France. All the, all the ones that have occurred are in yellow. And uh, this is the, the length of the heat wave. And this is the uh, maximum temperature uh, reached. And so far, we have averaged over the entire France. The longest heat wave was 25 days long with a mean national temperature record of, let's say, 30 degrees. All those bubbles are, if we reach the maximum level of global warming that we can have, if we do not apply any uh, restrictions to our emissions, you see that we are going to explore conditions that we've never seen in the past. So we can have heat waves lasting more than three months, and reaching more than 35 degrees at the scale of the total country, not just on the spot, at the total country. So we will explore conditions that we've never seen before, so we don't know whether our railways are going to, to support that. Uh, we do not know whether um, ourselves are going to support that, whether uh, all the, um, the conditions of uh, uh, evacuations, for example, if you have to be transported to the hospital, etc. If you have to, if you have to stop a, a fire, etc. We don't know whether all this is going to work. So, uh, we, we, with Natalie, we work for a, a regional group um, of experts for the Ile-de-France region, and Paris asked us last year to explain whether Paris could reach 50 degrees C of warming during summertime and of course they are thinking about reaching 50, 50 degrees C during uh, next next year when we will have the, the, the Jeux Olympiques, the European Games. So we looked at 1000 simulations, climate simulations and found 80 that said that 50 degrees C is possible in Paris and it start like 2022 with hot conditions in June 
very hot conditions in July and suddenly peaks to 50 in August and then hot conditions in September. And this can occur at 1.5 degrees of warming in certain models. So it's not impossible. And that's very interesting because then what Paris is going to do this September is to test whether fire, firework, uh, uh, emergency hospitals, etc., can cope with this. What can go wrong if we reach 50 degrees C? What is going to disrupt? What are the things they need to think about ahead of time? That's an interesting game. Frightening, but interesting. What was the a question? Yeah. yeah, actually, my question connects to that. Like, was what can city or local governments do, in your opinion, or is this something they can do, or has the action be taken? Has the action be taken globally to uh, prepare or to avoid the heat waves like that? Because I always feel, also in the city that I come from, what the local governments are doing. It's nice and they're trying, but it always feels like a bit of a drop on the hot stone. Yeah, What's so I think it's never a drop in, in a sense that um, it's an entrainment uh, effect. So everybody can do its little piece. Then what local governments have to do is really prepare for adaptation. So of course they need to, um, they need to, th I mean like Paris, Paris is attracting a lot of tourists. <coughs> And tourism is something that, of course, is, is a problem because most of the people come by plane, etc., etc. So what do you do? That, that's a real issue. But there is a way maybe to, 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 to work with tourism so that it becomes less problematic in terms of CO2 emissions, but it's the same for ecology. Um, but then they also need to know, and, and, um, and France, for example, has they also need to know how to adapt to certain conditions, and that's the case of Paris at 50 degrees C. But you see, recently in France, the government said, we will work for uh, climate mitigation, we will think of a world at 2 degrees C, and for climate adaptation, we will think of a world at 4 degrees C. And people say that, that this was just not a good way to do, to think. And I think they are wrong. I mean, you need to think for adaptation for the the worst weather you are going to, to reach in order to build whatever you need to build but that will sustain those temperatures if you, we, are, we are to reach them. But in terms of climate mitigation, you need to be very stringent and make sure that you do everything to avoid those things. If you build a dam that can resist very high uh, fluxes of water, then they can resist lower fluxes of water, but, but, uh, but the reverse is not true. So if you do adaptation and mitigation for the same level of warming, you may very well disrupt your adaptation procedure at one point. So local, climate, local uh, decision is very, very important for adaptation, but also for, for mitigation, again, as an entrainment, as knowledge diffusion, etc., and, and, and show the good practice. A country, a city can find something very, very surprising and very interesting that they could share. So I think we should not stop that. Uh, for rainfall, same, same um, events, uh, a wet extreme that occurs only once in 10 years in the absence of human influence uh, will, at the 1 degree C of warming, occur 1.3 times instead of one, so it's between one and two, but will be almost 7% wetter. And then if we reach two degrees C of warming, it will occur almost two times, but it will be 14% wetter. So you see that we do not change more the occurrence of those very wet extremes, but we change very strongly their intensity. And that's creating inundation, flooding, like we saw in Libya very recently, uh, and also in Greece, uh, I think it was two, three weeks ago, uh, that those were the, those kind of medicaids, those very, very intense events that carry much more water than they used to do 50 or 100 years ago. If we translate those changes in rainfall, in uh, wetening or drying of the soil, so here it's uh, changes in soil water content, that's why you see only the continents. 
Anytime you are in the yellow and brownish color, it's drying. Anytime you are in the green color, it's sweating. And we find again all the areas where uh, rainfall was decreasing uh, uh, and that I showed you uh, earlier. What is important is that you have rainfall decreasing or increasing, but on all continents, everywhere, evapotranspiration is increasing. So the loss of water by the soil is increasing because on the continents, a warmer air is a drier air in terms of relative humidity. A drier air is requesting water from the soil, from the vegetation. So anytime you warm your climate over land, the atmosphere will ask more water from the land and thus transpiration of the, of the vegetation will increase, evaporation from lakes and rivers will increase and most of the time, very often, it, it increases more than the rain, rainfall you bring back. Thus, you have very large areas in North America, and almost the entire American continent is going to dry up. You see that if you think of France, there is big drying in the Mediterranean, but not that much in the north. But if we increase temperature, then the entire France is going to dry out completely because precipitation or increases in precipitation will not compensate from the increase in loss of water from the soil. And very recent paper seems to say that this is underestimated over most of the continents. The drying that we are seeing here, the, the very recent years seem to show that the drying is going faster than what we expected because we have difficulties to really simulate the drying of the atmosphere over the continents. So there are new, this is science in progress, we learn any time an event uh, occurs, any time a new year uh, is happening, we learn more about our, our, how our climate evolves and we know better how to, to use our models and to understand what goes wrong in our climate models. What for me is really the most worrisome are all these equatorial regions. What, what this shows for different levels of warming, 1.5, 2 and 4 degrees C, is the areas that, that, uh, where we exceed thermal conditions that are dangerous for humans. Thermal stress. We always say that during heat waves we have more death uh, generally, and that's because we reach a level where the combination of air humidity and temperature exceeds what our body can accept, and the elder we are, the more difficult it is to accept certain conditions. And here it's from days to months per year where we exceed those specific thresholds that are difficult for humanity. You see that at 1.5 degrees C of warming already in, in, uh, in the Amazon, you have uh, places where you are between three and six months per year of suffering at 1.5 degrees C of warming. If we reach two degrees C of warming, this length also occurs in, in, in uh, Western Africa and in India. And in most tropical regions, it's between one or three months where you do experience temperatures that may bring you to the hospital. So that means that you have to change the time when you work. In China, they are already thinking about changing the hours of working, especially outside. If you think of farmers, in France, more and more farmers harvest during night now, because it's too hot during the day, especially in, in, in the big uh, tractor, that where you have all the heat from the engine, which makes your temperature in the cabin uh, exceeding 50 degrees C, you have to harvest during the night. So this is something, so that's why in, in Arabia, they think about building underground cities. Uh, so how do you adapt to this? And what is worse is that, it, so that, that's for human, but if you think about climate analog, that's a game that we, that we play, and I can send you a, a link where you can play with the analogs, which is you are at a specific place, 
you project yourself in a two degree sea of warming and you say, well, where is today the place that experienced the climate that I will experience at two degrees sea of warming? Mm -hmm. So in a few years. If you are here, you can always find a place southward that today experiences what you will experience here in Paris tomorrow. When you are in the equatorial regions, there is no analog. No analog at all. So to project the ecological changes, to think about what you, can, you will be able to farm in those regions in the future, you don't know. You have no analog. You don't know where to look. So you just have your imagination or your theoretical knowledge. But there is no, no place that you can look at <coughs> to think about this. So of course, in temperate regions, of course, we are experiencing things that are uh, not, not nice. But in equatorial regions, it's even worse. Because they are already exceeding thresholds of heat stress for human, also, of course, for animals, vegetation, etc. But they also cannot project themselves in the future. So that makes things very, very hard. So basically, the developing world will be affected. Very, they they very are hard. the one that contributes the less and affected the most. Yes. Oh, exactly. wow. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's a real reality. And anything about the US, because the US is just... Well, they, they are not at 11 ton per CO, uh, of CO2, I think they are at 30 or something like that. Per CO2. Do you know the number, Natalie? I think they are about 13 in the US, ton of CO2 per year. Ils sont très 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 and still they are not as affected as that. No, 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 no. For several reasons, first, they have the technology to adapt. Mm. They, are, they are in temperate regions. And you have the funding also to deploy some things to, to shelter yourself or, or to maladapt by uh, deploying uh, um, uh, uh, air conditioners, which is a maladaptation. Because it consumes more energy and it rejects the heat outside. So it makes the heat out the, the outside more hotter, more hot. So, um, so no, no, that's 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 a real issue. So again, I think it's really, it's really, and when you work at the global scale, that's also interesting because then you need to think about those those countries that maybe you don't see when you work in a temperate country at a very local scale or regional scale. You just see what happens around you and not what happens elsewhere. The question would be why then developed country like U.S. or China they are emitting so much but the cost is being incurred by the developing world. Why is that so? They, because, they, because I think when you are uh, starving or when you have a problem, climate change is not your biggest issue. If you just think about farming in Africa, uh, there is what we call the potential yield, so the maximum yield you can reach uh, with a specific crop. In Africa, they are at 25% of the potential gain. So their potential gain is 75% additional. In France, we are almost at 100% of the potential gain. So if you invest to technologies that improve the yield of what you are already planting, it's going to be better than the loss of yield that you're going to experience due to climate change. So, so that's the gain. Gaining yield is, is, is what they, they need to think about. So it's, it's just, I mean, we have the luxury to think about it. Yeah. It's not the case for every, every country and everywhere. Uh, if you think of extremes or hazards, what is interesting is that I talked about changes in intensity and mag or magnitude. So with uh, heat waves being more intense. We talked about changes in frequency. There are also evidence of longer durations of those events, especially for droughts that really last much longer. There are also questions of seasonal shift. In September, a heat wave, such as the one we had a few days ago, never happened in France. Starting school with a heat wave has never happened. So we have a seasonal shift of the events. We have a, a shift in the speed of the onset. Now we talk about flash droughts, a drought that just 
comes in a few hours or a few days instead of a few weeks. Its name is flash drugs. We've never heard the word flash drugs before. It's very new. Uh, and special extent. I told, talked about uh, national levels. Uh, a heat wave like 2003, which reached really all regions in France, had never had happened before 2003. It, you had a specific area in the Mediterranean Sea or in the southern west of France that experienced heat wave, but never the entire country. And si since 2003, we have many years where the entire country was experiencing a heat wave, even the far north east or north west of France, which generally was, uh, was, uh, was not experiencing this. So the, the, the hazards profile is changing with climate change. So we say more intense, more frequent in new places. Brittany, uh, I mean French Brittany, heat wave was not very often and it was a nice, nice thing. And now it's, it, they have experience in Brittany some very hot weather that was difficult to, to accept at other times. And there are also new combinations. So in, in, in the old times, you, you either had a heat wave or a drought, but you never had both together. Now you have more and more both heat wave and drought in combination. So this, again, is something for you. Um, we talked about sea level. There was a question about sea level earlier. So if, if we reach 2 degrees C uh, uh, of level, within the next 2,000 years, if we reach 2 degrees C of warming, within the next 2,000 years, the sea level can reach between 2 and 6 meters. We have a big uncertainty on that. Because we don't know absolutely very well how to do it, and we have an uncertainties on whether Antarctica is going to melt or not. So between two meters minimum rise of sea level, six meters ma maximum. But in 10,000 years from now, it will be eight meters. Because that's a very long process. Like melting of the, the sea, the, 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 the rising of sea level is a very long and slow process because the oceans are deep, because they are huge, etc. So it's a very slow process. Yeah. It's a very slow process. So it's so even if you would stop warming today, or if you would stop warming at 2 degrees sea level, the, the ice sheets will continue to melt, and the sea level will continue to rise. So you see that you commit not just the next generation, but a number of generations ahead of time. Yeah. Um, I find like this is new to me, and I find it very like it's quite a lot. Like, <laughs> and like, are there? Are Remember, last glacial maximum it was 120 meters below for 4 degrees of cooling. Yeah. Are there like other such like long like which are the because you've mentioned some throughout the presentation, you have like the three like most long term. Um, Long term, it's the Greenland and Antarctica, whether they are going to melt or not. Yes. So the melting of ice sheet and of glaciers is a very slow process. And the rise of sea level. It's the, the two, at least the two that we have worked on uh, in, in our community. And you see that for 3 degrees C of warming, uh, it can be up to 24 meters in a 10,000 years commitment. So we really, uh, that's why when I talked about, uh, about coastal regions and not building anymore in coastal regions, because we, we commit ourselves for a very, 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 very long time. So it doesn't mean anything just to, be, to, to build the walls. The Netherlands are in, in, it's problematic because they are already below sea level, so they need to come even more below sea level. That's a real issue also. So you cannot gain eight meters, it's, it's a lot. It's, and even two meters, it's a lot, for, for many, many, many very flat regions. Um, Natalie, shall I stop or shall I go to very quickly to the world? Well, it's 23, so I, I think... Do you want to ask more questions? Yeah, that may be more questions. 
That was like a couple of weeks ago. There was a comment by Elon Musk who said that like he's our favorite. He was basically saying that uh, land use changes uh, don't matter. The only thing that matters is like CO two emissions. And uh, what, like, what do you make out of that statement? What's the relative like value of like land use? Okay. Changes? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> come on, the most <laughs> So, land use changes, so they, they matter, um, they, they matter because they, they and, and that's what I think here, because they, they contribute by 23% to the emissions of the land system. Okay? So, they do contribute to our total emissions. So, you, if you do not exploit your land, you have less greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so, so, so that's that's one answer. Then they, they matter a lot, and that's what I was showing here. They matter a lot at the at the local and regional scales because they do exchange at all times energy, not just greenhouse gases. They, they exchange aerosols, water, uh, heat with the atmosphere, and thus they have the potential to. Um, to change or to mitigate locally an extreme event. We know that in an area where, for example, if you have, um, if you are here on Paris region and you have just harvested your field, it's July, so the, the soil is completely bare, and you have a, a, a heat wave that comes, that is brought uh, by, by the atmosphere. If it comes over a uh, um, uh, field that has been harvested and that does not send any more transpiration to the, to the atmosphere, any more water vapor, then your, your air masses, that is, let's say, 4 degrees C warmer than usual, will climb up to 7 or 8 degrees C warmer. If it flows over uh, a forest, it will go from 4 to 2 or 1 degree C. So it will it will lower the intensity of the heat wave. So you can modulate the intensity of an extreme event by the way you occupy your land. That's why we want to green our cities. We want to green our cities to cool our cities because a plant sends water vapor in the atmosphere, so it takes energy to the soil and it sends it in the atmosphere. So it has an effect at the local and regional scale. It has an effect in modulating the CO2 in the atmosphere. It captures CO2. Today, ecosystems take 29% of our CO2 emissions. So, and we can probably increase this number by playing cleverly with our land. <laughs> of course, the first big issue is CO2 emitted by our activities. Mm. But you can modulate a third, a fourth to a third of those by playing with your land. So land users doesn't have a zero effect, especially at the local scale, at the regional scale. So at the global scale, it's through greenhouse gas mediation. At the local scale, it's through how it plays with energy and water. And that was part of one of my conclusions, I guess. So land areas contribute to the evolution of climate globally because they are at the same time source and sink of CO2. So they, are, they have an indisputable role in climate mitigation. And locally, regionally, because they must be used to modulate the manifestation of climate change. But what I'm surprised about is that Elon Musk says that CO2 matters. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> So the fact that it takes well, what we do to the land doesn't matter. Right. It's just uh, it's, it's nothing. But if you say that CO two matters, then we made a big, a big step. I yeah. Are there more questions? Yes. It's, um, it's it's less again less related. I think. But like I I heard in the past that for planes because they pollute at a higher level than the. Yes. That, they, yeah. that it's like worse, and like, I, why? What is the reason for this? Like, because there is like this mis showing of like the emission is showed in comparison with other things, but because it's at a higher level. Uh, like so I'm, I'm not sure I would understand. I would I would completely respond to this. But if you in global warming, the what we call the troposphere, so the first uh, 
five kilometers of the atmosphere warm, and the stratosphere is cooling down. When you send planes that fly essentially in the stratosphere, they will warm also the stratosphere. And this double warming, I think, makes things worse for the surface. But I don't know exactly all the physics that goes below this. But there, there are, there are. I mean, you can find many. Uh, I mean, if you send me an email, I can, I can put you in the hands of one of my colleagues who knows very well how to answer this kind of question. But it has to do with how we, uh, we warm the stratosphere that naturally cools down even with climate change, and that, so that changes the distribution of energy in the atmospheric system. So there, there is no easy answer. No. <laughs> yes, because I was searching before, because someone told me that there is like this mispresentation of the thing that I couldn't find the answer. Okay, uh, I, I can find the, I can find the, the reference. Yes, you have a question? I think we're out of time. So do you? I mean, I have to have just a quick question on how does um, population density relate to land use patterns? Because if we look at um, land use patterns in Western <coughs> Europe or in uh, the United States of America, uh, it's very well planned and, yeah. and the land density is very low. So the population pressure is uh, commensurate to pressure on land use. But if we look at, let's say, the Amazon, or if we look at South Asia as a subcontinent, the population pressure on per square meter of land is very high and mm -hmm. it's essentially either unplanned or yeah. inhabitable or unusable, yeah, uh, especially in South Asia. And that is also primarily the region which is now facing a very high precipitation pressure because Pakistan and Bangladesh yes. both have a very frequent and a very long run of floods and cyclones. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Uh, if that is related or if that has a role to play, because in a policy perspective, that has a very important uh, yeah, role yeah. to play. So uh, th this will again affect the regional climate, but not the global climate. What matters for the global climate is really the amount of uh, emissions that come from those areas, and that is well mixed in the atmosphere. But at the local scale, it matters a lot because it will matter the way uh, a, a precipitation in, in, in event will transform into a flood. Uh, it will it will affect um, the the manifestation of an extreme weather event, whether a heat wave or a drought. It will affect uh, wind speed, and thus how convection matters, etc. So it, it really will affect this density. Then the planification is something else, but that goes through policy. And then it has implications on climate, but it's really a long, a long loop. Any other question? Maybe we can stop there. So is there are no other questions because it has been a long day.